And what I was interested in, he's a, is, as an artist, the same as with an artist like John Cage, for example, is somebody who I've often read their work but haven't listened to as much. And uh, when his proposal first came ahead for actually doing a piece, uh, I spoke to a young Diddy who introduced me, and uh, he suggested, or asked me if I had any suggestions about a piece that would kind of fit into this environment, this kind of more avant-garde experimental environment. And uh, I was really kind of sympathetic with his approach to it and the, the whole of the kind of sonic acts uh, supporting, really, because the whole point of the project seemed to be to bring an audience into an environment that wouldn't otherwise enter that kind of space. And so I, I come from a kind of uh, do the best as you can when you play the piano kind of background and try and make, you know, the best of the kind of tools you've got. I can't actually read. I read music when I was about 11 or 12. And I, you could test me now. It would probably take me half an hour to read like a little uh, tiny ABC piano piece or something. But uh, with this piece, uh, I had various kind of uh, approaches to it. I had to kind of think through in my head. And I've read quite a lot about Stockhausen's work and the kind of ideas and so on. And I chose the piece Hymnen. I certainly don't, I don't know how many people here know the word Hymnen. I, I, I've only sort of, I've had it for about five years, the actual piece in question, but I've never actually studied it in the sense that when I say study, I mean actually read through the notes, read through the, the kind of a biography. And I can see all these connections with my work. It sounds kind of arrogant to say connections with my work, stock housing me, but by no means. But last year on the, uh, the BBC in England and also the Wire magazine, which is quite a popular uh, music magazine, they did a feature, and uh, the BBC commissioned this five-day program called The Music Machine. And I had this ridiculous phone call where somebody from the BBC rang me up and said, would you send a 20-minute dat tape to Stockhausen? Which I kind of thought was a joke. I mean, it's not the kind of thing. You, know, you, you don't usually get somebody ringing up saying, well, Tarantino's on the phone. He wants to do the new film with you, Robin, or anything like that. So it was kind of slightly absurd, it seemed, at the time, because I thought this is a, a very respected musical figure and somebody that has been in the, you know, kind of... Uh, Creative music scene for about you know 30 or 40 years and doing the most extraordinary work with kind of the sonic architecture of sound and so on, and so that kind of spurred me at the back of my mind as well. And I was kind of inspired by the fact he was so enthusiastic about my work. He talked about some of the other artists in a slightly more, a slightly less uh, pleasant way. And I came out sort of the best. He didn't like it, didn't absolutely love it, but he he gave me some ideas to sort of spur me on with his piece and. Uh, what I'm going to kind of just talk through now very briefly, I'm going to talk for about maybe 15, 20 minutes and give the opportunity for questions and so on. Uh, and what you heard at the beginning, I should say, is just a tiny excerpt. What I'm actually doing tonight is I've actually got like a big sample with lots of samples and sounds I've kind of reprocessed and kind of uh, deconstructed in some sense. So what you were hearing just now is one sound that I've kind of played at different pitches and kind of processed it slightly. And it's one tiny excerpt from Hymnon, the actual... Uh, old uh, record release, the old Decca release I've got. And uh, somebody just loaned me him on, on a CD and you get kind of two different versions of it. You also get a, a very handsome booklet with it that goes through the kind of theories behind it and so on. And so uh, I just wanted to sort of reach out here in some sense and try and explain from my kind of slightly naive point of view what I was trying to do and whether it works or not obviously is dependent upon you as a, you as a, a passive listener in some sense. And this opportunity is a, is a small chance for me to kind of try and talk through the work and as other people probably know, it's not until you actually start talking about something that it kind of makes some sense if you come out with some kind of structure. So in the actual booklet, uh, Stockhausen was talking about bridges and uh, between pieces, and it's kind of used the phrase flood of sound. And in the actual booklet, I've got a quote here, it's this kind of low distorted tone that hisses and hovers over the regions. And uh, the, the piece hymn, in, in one sense, it, it uses a lot of... Uh, National anthems. If you haven't heard the piece, it's it's quite recognisable. Lots of the, the elements of it, because suddenly uh, the internationale or something will suddenly appear, and you suddenly think, I know this tune really well. And these kind of uh, these elements will keep breaking through. And with the work I've been doing, I've been using conversations, and I've been travelling quite a lot in the last sort of two or three years, and I've always recorded in the local area. With my work, I've, I've used this kind of a uh, generic phrase, which is like map in the city or kind of sound Polaroid. So when I've been doing concerts, for, for example, if I record or do a show in Amsterdam, a lot of the sound source I use is taken from the kind of ether, the radio waves of Amsterdam. If I travel to Tokyo, I use the sound from Tokyo and so on. And what I've done over the last couple of years is actually compiled an archive of these recordings, just like street sounds and so on. It's fairly you know, a common thing for lots of musicians to do. But also using intimate conversations between individuals in these different countries. And so, I, I call these the kind of regions of the piece. 
And instead of using national anthems, I would use different accents, different dialects, and also different uh, languages completely. And the, kind of the fun element of it in some way, in sort of the way hymnum works, is suddenly shortwave radio parts will break through and you'll recognize part of a theme from a, a tune or something. And the way this work, hopefully for me, is working at least, is that a voice will break through, and as soon as you hear maybe a Dutch voice, your ear tunes through to it. If I played it to somebody who was French, they were suddenly tuning to the French voice, and so on. And uh, he talks about the subjective, subjective centre of the piece, which I, had, I was trying to see as myself. I had to, if you're a composer or an artist, it's obviously a very subjective. So if I'm drink, excuse me. Uh, I'm the subjective centre of it in some sense, and so I'm the kind of English voice in it in some way trying to negotiate, trying to navigate the different voices, the different textures, the different tones, and so on. And uh, what appealed to me was the actual openness of the score. I know, as I keep emphasizing, I'm not actually a trained musician, so there wasn't a score for me to read. There was a score for me to read. I probably wouldn't have been able to interpret it in, in a certain way. And what I must emphasize, this isn't a version of Hinder. What I was pointing out was through the pieces that I personally like of Stockhausen's. I took this, and there was another piece, Gold Dust, which is an absolutely exquisite piece, really beautiful, very, very peaceful record. Uh, and I took a couple of parts from that as well, but there was another quote that he uses from the, from the liner notes to the CD, where he says, the openness of the score of the piece is for radio, television, opera, ballet, recording, concert hall, church, and out of doors. And that kind of appealed to me that it wasn't, it, this, the, the piece hymnum wasn't written towards a certain uh, audience in a way. It wasn't written towards a certain this kind of cliche image one might have of uh, what classical audience look like. I mean, we all have these kind of images of what traditional avant-garde concert audiences look like, pop audiences, club audiences, techno, and so on. And I come from more techno-related stuff. Almost by default, I do sort of more dance orientated records and so on. And this project, excuse me, the piece map in Stockhausen is by no means a kind of techno project. It's actually using a lot of the sounds from the piece in them piece gold dust and also contactor and kind of recontextualizing it in a more kind of 30 minute compact version because uh, one of the, the kind of rules of the game tonight is the fact that I move in 30 minutes from the avant-garde through to the kind of the more accessible dance scene. So I've got this kind of 30 minutes is like a little sort of a mini marathon I have to run through and sort of hit the beats at the end or something. Uh, and there's a, there's a the, the other element I found very appealing was the found objects in the actual piece of uh, the actual recording of him, no. there's a lot of speech, there's crowd noises, there's conversations, there's shortwave radio demonstrations, recording of a Chinese shop and so on. And the work I've been doing over the, the years of Scanner, has, I could see myself, I could see connections with this in the way that I like using a lot of found sound. It certainly isn't unusual, again, as I say, for an artist or a musician, whether you're a, a sculptor, whether you're a photographer and so on, you use a lot of visual images you pick up from, from seeing other people's work from the street, from television, from other media culture and so on. But what appealed to me was the fact that he was using a lot of what I, I kind of call debris in a way. The sort of stuff that when you're in the studio you try and get rid of. And I read a, a little sort of narrative in there that says that in the actual piece you hear a lot of Stockhausen's voice himself. He puts himself in as the kind of, not centre, but there's this element of the composer still being there. You hear him breathing at certain points during the piece. And what I kind of liked was the fact that part of the work I've been doing is this kind of a uh, I get called like a telephone terrorist and all these ridiculous kind of aggressive sounding things, but is surreptitiously listening to other things you're not supposed to listen to in some sense. And so I kind of like the, the appeal was the fact that in this piece, Stockhausen didn't realize it was being recorded, first of all, by one of his colleagues. And, <coughs> excuse me, uh, when he discovered, he said, great, let's, let's kind of you know, incorporate it into the piece. And so what you hear during the actual composition, that when you hear it played back, is elements of Stockhausen's voice appearing back, saying various phrases like, that sounds good, or okay, or shit, that's terrible, and this kind of stuff. And I kind of like, personally, I like that personal element reintroduced into the, into the piece. And that's what I've actually enjoyed about Stockhausen's work, the work I like, is that kind of introduction, that personal element. But having said this, I probably know well kind of four or five Stockhausen pieces. And I mean, the catalogue is phenomenal. It's such a, a huge amount of work. And for this piece, I could have chosen another composer. I could have chosen another artist to go with, but I was listening to him then at the point when Jan Hidding rang me up, and I thought, well, this kind of fits in in some sense. There must be more connections than I've even realised. And so, what tonight you will hear is a kind of a, a 30 minute piece of building layers of sound, building. I can play you if people are interested, you know, any more excerpts from it. That's kind of 
what you were hearing, as I said, is just but one layer. It's kind of one filtered sound that's kind of processed and built up in different textures, like a sort of architectural piece or something. And it builds through, and the last piece, whether it's going to be controversial or not, I've actually written uh, a kind of drum and bass style uh, pattern where I've actually taken samples from Contactor using bass drums and snare drums and pitched them high and low and tried to create something with some real sense of movement because I'm just aware tonight in some sense, and this is the cries of sellout probably, I don't know, but I'm just aware that with an audience who maybe aren't so accustomed to hearing avant-garde or experimental music, and this is what I see appealing about tonight, I think it's quite important, the element of repetition, the element of structure, in the sense of simple repetitive beats. And that's not to say you need a 4-4 time kick drum going on and on or anything like that. But you can actually, with, with drum and bass, which is a very inspiring form of a composition, it's particularly in the UK, some amazing stuff been coming out, where you can take a simple drum pattern and there's a lot of kind of cut and paste element between different rhythms, different beats and so on. And whether you like it or not, it's a, a phenomenal sort of original approach to playing with kind of rhythm structure and so on. Whether you can dance to it is another thing, it's another challenge in some way, you know. So whether people actually dance in the last kind of five minutes or not, who knows? And it's kind of a could be a positive challenge, you know, I really don't know. But I kind of don't want to talk too much anymore about it in some sense. The piece is, is relatively straightforward. It moves through five different regions and that moves from kind of very abstract gentle tones through to a more kind of a, as I say, more drama based, more aggressive closure to the piece. And I actually recorded a session for VPRO, which might be slightly more representative of the piece because the only problem with playing in a venue like the Paradiso or any grand venue is it's a great audience, it's a great space, but you lose any of the kind of subtleties. And the idea of the piece is there's some very, very gentle textures in it, some very gentle tones. But unfortunately, with, a, with an audience there as well, in that kind of environment, you need to pump up the volume. And with that volume going up in the PA system, there's the chances are it's going to distort slightly. You're going to lose those kind of tiny, intricate elements that are quite important to the piece. So if anybody gets a chance, this isn't necessarily an advert for it, but also if people aren't coming tonight, it's supposed to be an opportunity to tune in the radio and hear kind of another version of it, you know, kind of version I just did in the studio yesterday. Uh, maybe that's all I should say at the moment. and just open it up and see if anybody had any questions or anything. And we have like a... We've got up until about 6 o'clock, so uh, we're kind of, we don't have all the time in the world, but enough for lots of questions if anybody has anything particularly they want to ask about it. And I've been kind of general about the piece here. There might be something particular people want to ask about it, I'm not sure. But I mean, maybe if people put their hands up and I can just kind of attempt to uh, give some answer. Thank you. First yeah. question. What's your politics? What are my politics? In what sense, sorry? Well, you're using a, a piece like Human, which is, you know, basically national anthems are the projection of the nation state. Yeah. Which is a pretty sort of fundamental uh, political statement. I'm asking you what your politics is. Well, it's, I mean, to be quite honest, and this is a, a very, not candid, but it's a, in a, on a personal level, it's kind of, I didn't actually vote until four years ago uh, in England. And this wasn't uh, kind of being a, a really rough anarchist or anything like that. It's kind of, I didn't actually know political party would ever appeal to me, to be quite honest. It never... I was, when I grew up, I kind of was curious that why would you vote for this party when this party could do, you know, would, would somebody would do something good for education, somebody would cut this thing and so on. I could never see it. I'm saying very, very simple about this. Mm -hmm. But with the piece, him, then, I, I was trying to reflect on the elements of the, the, not a nationalistic approach, which is why I'm trying to avoid, the problem I always have with kind of performance is the, is the ego element. And it's something that I have a personal problem with, which is there's a figure up there who is the composer. And I'm not somebody who's playing a score of somebody else's work. It's actually my piece that I've put together. And it's an element, it's a, it's a problem I've often had, and I always, often want to just disappear and kind of hide it aside and kind of let this thing play, maybe with some visual element playing and so on. So this, there's all the kind of national voices going on. There's quite, quite a huge collection of kind of New York and Japanese and so on accents feeling. And whether, I'm kind of apolitical in some sense, and I don't know whether you know, this is going to be a controversial element. I hadn't probably considered the, the kind of political approach to it. No, well, you've answered my question. Yeah. That's not, a, that's not an important issue. Yeah. Right. But do you think that uh, it was for Stockhausen when you made it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't know how other people feel about Stockhausen or how well they know the work, but he kind of, in some sense, he kind of scares me in a way. You kind of hear these stories about him quite being sort of almost a, a totalitarian or something. And I know about it. Yeah, it's quite, I mean, it's quite funny. He sounds like quite an eccentric, but we need eccentrics to kind of move different movements along and so on. Mm. So. I don't know, I've never met up with him as such, but the stories, when they came back from the BBC, when they told me the stories about meeting up with him, it was so amazing and so funny. Uh, I couldn't quite believe it, you know, extremely funny. Oh, no. <laughs>
hear it. They want to hear it first and then like. Just to see if people haven't heard it yet, so I can escape a bit. With this piece, what I what I would usually do when I edit, or like uh, as any kind of <coughs> creative person would do, is kind of they choose pieces, or they, they listen to work, or they, they view film they've produced, and so on. And they were edits in some sense; they were kind of processing in some way. And that's what I usually do with conversations, or voices, or stand-up archive, whether it's me on the street recording something going on. And I would, out of my own personal vision or whatever, I would choose this sound over this sound, this voice over this voice, and so on. And so for this, I try to be a bit more, not careless isn't the right word, if that means, almost means that you don't, you, you're not taking, paying attention or anything. But I, I quite deliberately did kind of a live mix of like about, it's about 20 different uh, languages. And within each of those languages, there's different dialects. So with, with Flemish, for example, I've been in Belgium, Rotterdam, Utrecht, Amsterdam, and so on. So there's this kind of accents. And the kind of interesting thing for me as well, for anybody, is that you can't cheat with some of these things. I can't secretly spend an evening in Rotterdam and think I can play the tape of the voices I played in Rotterdam. Because people recognise dialects, and you kind of, until you start doing work like this, you forget that it's very local to the area. It's kind of, it's very reflective of that environment, of that city, of that town, or whatever. And so, with this piece, I produced this kind of 30-minute kind of collage in some sense, which I'm going to be mixing in various intervals of, uh, as I say, these 20 different accents or 20 different. Uh, the languages. Sorry, the chat here. Yeah. Um, maybe I've got to the answer now, but no, I thought of something else. Uh, if, if this project is very much connected up to, to Stockhausen, which is for this very yeah. personal reasons for you, but um, how would one move on from this project? I mean, would you map a barrier? Or I don't know, it sounds, I mean, it sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? It's almost like a kind of a it's like you have a little sort of process, and it's kind of like, what shall I do? Let's do mapping bath this week or something. Then it sounds like there's kind of horrible hooks on classics, you know. <laughs> it's kind of, you know, hooks on Haydn or something. Remember, no, I won't be doing that. But this is a very particular project. I don't usually get commissioned pieces. The only other piece I'm doing that relates to this is I'm doing a version of Fontana Mix by John Cage in London in November. That, I can see a reflection there in the sense that that event is at a place called the Royal Festival Hall, and... Uh, which, which is a very kind of establishment venue. It's where you go and hear opera and you hear classical music quite a lot of the time. And as a percentage of the, the program, it's jazz music and pop music and world music. And what's interesting about that event, which kind of relates to this, is that they have bands like Elastica, this English pop band, uh, attempting to do a Lamont Young piece. Uh, the band Stereo Lab, or another English sort of pop guitar band, are doing like a Terry, uh, Terry Riley piece, I think it is. And it's kind of extraordinary... Uh, collection of bodies being invited to do this project. And part of the point of it is, and I see this connection here, maybe I'm you know, being too enthusiastic, but I think it's really exciting to kind of introduce people to new styles of music. And I know a lot of people, I've got a friend, David Took, who's a, a writer, but also a musician. And when we first met, it was a really healthy point, because there was a point when so-called ambient music, and this horribly sort of generic term I have to use here, was suddenly becoming very big about four or five years ago. And it was enough that his work was being more accepted by the kind of a, a kind of popular press in some sense. And it was a really important moment, I think, it kind of opened a lot of people's ears and eyes up, you know. In fact, you can go to any standard record shop now in London, I can go to like a big version mega store, and have a lot more kind of abstract, avant-garde work than you'd ever have had kind of five years ago. Because there was kind of almost a, an intellectual environment opened up for people in some sense. And they were listening to kind of techno, the thing that appealed to me about techno was the fact you'd have very abstract textures going on quite often, with these kind of full-on beats you'd be dancing to, but there was no traditional song structure, there was no traditional kind of tune sometimes even, but it was actually quite a positive thing I found. Um, I remember in that uh, wild issue when yeah. Mr. Hauser made his comments on uh, the music of you, and I believe uh, so two other guys? He did a, he did a the Aphex Twin, Richard James, yeah, did yeah. a Richie Horton, this Canadian DJ producer, and a couple of other people. He made this comment that he didn't like us to repetitive uh, aspects of the music, and he made this, yeah. this comparison that he 
with someone who is stuttering and can't get his word out of yeah. his mouth, what do you think of, think of such a comment? Yeah, it's one thing I've always been, it's one thing I quite disagree with. It's one of the most kind of strongest things he said. It's like he played a, if anybody knows the work of Richie Horton, it's very minimal, it's really like, I kind of like it because it's very hypnotic, very minimal kind of structured beats over a very simple kind of bass pattern. There's no sense of melody quite often, just this kind of pattern building up and up in structure. And uh, he hated it. He said, this sort of music is designed for dance bars. And he kind of gave away his kind of, you know, his out of touch elements because he, he said that this music is designed for dance bars, which in fact it is. You know, that is the point of that, a lot of that kind of music and so on. But I think it's a, re repetition can be a very attractive uh, tool to use, it can be very seductive in a sense, because it can draw you into a piece quite easily. And I know that, I mean, I've been to a number of concerts where you listen to an abstract piece of music, for me as a listener, as a passive listener, an abstract piece that goes on for like five hours or something, I've been to performances, and at some point you're kind of craving for some sense of, maybe I'm sounding too traditionalist in a sense, but like a, I'm not asking for like, like some, you know, 4-4 four, four pattern or something, but even the implication of rhythm in some sense, and it can even be pattern that only repeats every 30 seconds or something. But, you know, I personally find that my brain kind of tunes into it and can draw me into it in quite, a, as I say, seductive manner. And I don't know, it's, it's, it's the one thing I find difficult listening is, is it can be very abstract pieces that kind of clatter away in some sense. This is a very personal element, this is, you know, I'm saying very controversial here, but that's the kind of stuff I find most difficult to uh, empathise with or digest can be work that I can find no kind of structure in my own head to kind of work through or something. Maybe that's a good thing in some sense. Maybe that teaches you to work harder at it. I, you know, I don't deny it. But weren't you surprised that from a man like Schrepphausen uh, that he was, uh, he wasn't aware of the fact that uh, with this kind of music, his first music that, that doesn't change. So yeah. it was his dogma that music has to change yeah. from a man who has yeah, it's quite ironic. Yeah, of course it is. Yeah, I just, I mean, obviously, he's in his own, his own castle. Mm -hmm. He's in his own world. He's in his own castle. It's kind of a. It comes with age. Yeah, it looks possibly. Like. I don't know. I mean, you know, there's, it's, it's not always a generational thing. I and mean, the thing that's kind of appealed to me about the, <laughs> the liberation of the kind of ambient techno thing is there's kind of no age barriers in some sense. I run a, a club, a space in London. But there is no. It's not designed for girls and baby tees and boys and fancy little baggy pants. It's for anybody to go along to. It's a really kind of healthy environment. You know, and that's the thing that's kind of appealed to me particularly about, I mean, I've always listened to kind of a lot of experimental kind of electronic avant-garde stuff over the years. And to see people, fairly big kind of, you know, techno names, putting things like that in their charts and listening to it or DJing with it, which has happened quite a lot in England, I've noticed at clubs, people will play, you know, the most, you know, as an artist being played in a kind of club, for example. You know, it's a fantastic thing to have. Um, what we see like in the past years is a lot of these sort of projects trying to bridge popular music and, and, and sort of serious music and um, we're sort of getting this sort of avant pop sort of trend and um, well, my first question is and we haven't heard the piece and I don't know your music yeah, but where, where do you expect your music to be heard and what do you think about this new sort of uh, like, you know, you have this uh, dance music getting more and more, like, um, sort of avant-garde, and, um, and you say, like, your piece, like, on, one, on one hand, it's like, you miss a lot of sort of nuances uh, in, yeah. you know, like, in a, in a disco, sort of like, uh, disco. So, what's your vis vision of, like, this new sort of trend, or what do you think about that it's sort it's of gray area? It's a great, it's a big question, really, as well, isn't it? It's kind of how you kind of predict uh, sound being moved into, you know, which environment. What interests me is the, something I've been thinking about recently, is the way that, how we listen to music, and the way that in the last 15 years, we've actually started listening to music in a different way, because 15 years ago, the Sony Walkman was just sort of being introduced, and we listened to music at home, and I'm 32 now. When I was about sort of um, 14 or 15, I really listened to records in a very intense fashion, and actually did that sad kind of thing where you'd switch the lights out, you'd actually listen to a record, and you, you kind of learn this piece inside out. And what kind of has interested me is the way that people kind of listen to sound more environmentally now. They take sound can be, you can take sound with you wherever you go. They've been very interested in the way that we passively kind of digest 
uh, that sound, the way that we actually can take music with us to any kind of environment. You can sit on a plane. Whenever you travel on a plane now, you can take sound with you. You can take... If they have a... If that's have making it become sort of a noise, like you have it in supermarkets, elevators... Yeah, I agree in some sense, yeah. The yeah. thing is, like, is it music sort of losing its um, sort of attention by the audience? I don't know. I try and be as positive as possible. I think it's a, any open up of any kind of event, anything that can engage an audience to listen to something they wouldn't otherwise listen to. It, it's weird how you, as an individual your perception changes over the years, obviously. You know? Even with like television and advertising, the way the television in England, I don't actually get some of the adverts sometimes. You'll see that they don't understand what they're advertising. You know, it's, it's extraordinary. The kind of language is so sophisticated now, it's gone beyond any kind of meaning and so on. And we're a very visual, visually literate now. And I read a disturbing statistic recently where children at schools now don't uh, they, have, they, they read much slower than they used to because they actually look at it as blocks, as visual blocks. They don't read it as text. And I find that kind of disturbing statistic in some sense that we're, we're becoming a very visual culture like that. I know I'm not talking about music here, but I'm kind of, I keep finding these kind of connections with sort of visual aesthetic and hearing aesthetic and so on. But I think that kind of appealed to me with, with my own recording has been this kind of walk on culture. And I've been working on pieces that are very, very peaceful. I kind of like the idea that when you use a Walkman to listen to music, you, you start hearing the environment. You start hearing trams going by. You hear people walking by. And I like working with uh, trying to place sound in certain areas, trying to put like, a little voice over there. So you're listening to this piece, but you don't know whether it's somebody talking behind you on the bus, whether it's actually on the piece or not. And it kind of links back to the way I suddenly realized that I became interested in incorporating voices into music. It was in 1980, Brian Eno released an album called On Land. Excuse me. I don't know if anybody knows this album. It's actually one of my favourite albums. It's almost like environmental recordings or kind of uh, sound photographs of Cornwall, a place that Brian Eno as an artist really liked and wanted to kind of reproduce on a record or on a compact disc. And I bought the record when I was like 15 or 16 years old. And I went home and put the record on. And what I really loved about the record was in the background you could hear these tiny, tiny voices and I listen to it, and I just, I love the element of like, the almost kind of dissipating, almost disappearing, just like a sort of, a mist or something that would be there and then disappear again. And uh, I was so excited about this record, and I put it on a couple of days later and the voices weren't there. And it's kind of like, <laughs> shit, you know, what's happening? I don't take drugs, I don't drink, what's going on? <laughs> Actually, it was a time when CB radio was really popular. And what my amplifier at home was picking up was somebody on a CB radio around the corner going, Roger Coppy, I want a cup of tea or whatever people talk about. <laughs> but I kind of, I suddenly realised quite recently that that was quite an important element for me, the way that that kind of, that chance encounter, that, that kind of occasion happening, it was quite a spark, obviously, at the back of my little creative mind, you know, for doing this kind of work. I mean, so the subject is so big, I'll probably just talk for hours, otherwise I should answer another question. <laughs> if I don't, I'll just carry on now. <laughs> You said you, that a piece you're going to do to the repeat singer goes sometime up in towards drum and bass. Yeah. How much life is it involved in drum and bass? Like if you play live, would those bits be linked together live or is it something which is already taped? The, the entire piece tonight, uh, it's 30 minutes long. Apart from the last part, there's just a, there's a rhythm pattern on that which I can't physically play live. It's, uh, it's the, what, I, what I kind of enjoy, the thing that initially appealed to me about drum and bass I don't know if everybody here even, you know, knows what drum and bass records sound like. I certainly wouldn't want to assume it. But uh, what appealed to me was the fact that digital technology has enabled us to create sound that we'd never otherwise be able to create, and visuals, and so on, and computer work, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. And drum and bass was a genre of music that kind of was born because, not because, but due to the advent of like sampling. And there's no way you can physically play those drum breaks, there's like... Nobody's playing live. Yeah. People do play them, but some of the, some of the sounds are so, <clears throat> so extraordinarily fast. I mean, where people, there'll be a drum break that goes like, like this, but like, even faster, I mean, incredible. And so, what, what's exciting about it for, for me, when you compose music, is, is hearing a kind of genre of music evolving over the last four or five years, like drum and bass in England, when it began, began on kind of pirate radio stations and, and so on. And... I, kind of, I find 
is so exciting, the, these kind of, the, the appeal of this kind of, the, the kind of frenetic speed of this sort of work. And so, you're right tonight, I can't physically play, I've only got ten fingers, you see, and if I had kind of more, I'd probably be trying to do it. If there's two of you, you can try and do it. I do a, I do a separate project which involves those kind of aspects, and you can play it live. And in England, there's a couple of clubs where people play live drums, live percussion for drum and bass. But I'm not sure, uh, you know, with, with some of the work, whether it can actually ever exist without... I do think I'm thinking of some kind of um, different sample of beats. No, it's all. That, that no, it's all. Like no, it's, it's nobody else. It's, it's no like. Uh, what I've done is kind of map sounds over a keyboard with, with, with a sampler. So every key reflects a certain sound. What I do live as well is I pitch them all live and kind of uh, filter them. Just take so there will be a sound playing, but you don't hear. You just feel it. Just open the filter up and close it, and so on. I and see. Uh, it's very simple, really. It's kind of. A, so I'm not a really good musician, but I'm trying my best to do this piece. Uh, but, but see, I can play a tiny excerpt. You can hear what it, you know, you can hear kind of what it would sound like slightly. Uh, you can hear the way I've kind of just uh, taken the beats. And this is a. Uh, Yeah, this isn't a commercial, this isn't for a commercial release. It's interesting because the whole... It's I'm sorry? It's yeah, absolutely. So whether we register it as a <coughs> performance, it's a very interesting debate. The whole, there's a huge debate going on in England at the moment with record companies where I've been doing various talks about sampling, the issues about sampling, which are, which are really complex because lots of record companies kind of forget that younger people, because with digital technology we can now reproduce sounds perfectly. I mean, with, CD players and that machine is as easy as that. And a lot of kind of record companies forget that younger people create music today, like maybe if you're just 18 or 19 and you've got like a, a tiny studio, digital technology has meant that you can now buy a 64-track digital recorder for like 2,000 pounds as a new Roland one. 
and it's a phenomenal machine. The potential of that is really exciting. <coughs> It's, it's kind of education of, of, of people. I'm, I'm slightly moving away from the point, but I'll go back to it. And the, the important thing in some sense is to kind of educate people about sampling. And the thing I've noticed that a lot of people have grown up on what, what gets known as kind of hip-hop culture, DJ culture. And when, when DJs first started playing, they would, they would scratch their, their kind of trademark, was scratching other records in. The, the way they became recognized DJs in this kind of house genre or this kind of whatever genre or whatever, would be the way they kind of manipulated other people's records. And the early records were kind of almost like a, a representation, uh, a record of what their gig sounds like when they play out live and so on. So lots of us have grown up, me included, on hearing that kind of thing. Then you suddenly come into this awful ethical debate about basically what you're doing is breaking the law. You can't use somebody else's work and then release it as your own. There's been, I was called in a sample case with a singer called Björk, this Icelandic singer last year where she used one of my, rec one of my recordings. And it was a, a three-month situation, a complete nightmare in my life, where I said, I don't actually mind. You know, I was actually quite flattered, because I said a lot of the work I'm using is from the ether and so on. But I had a record company who, excuse me, wanted to pursue the entire case and so on. And it cost me £3,000 in legal fees, which her company then paid. This is a, it's still distracting for me, but it's quite an interesting sort of sideline to this whole debate. And, it's extraordinary because then it reflects back on the media because then in the media in, in Holland actually as well uh, somebody came up to me and said so you're a rich man now Robin I said well no more than I ever was you know kind of arrived by the tram at the Paradiso <laughs> and uh, they said uh, you just got a million pounds I hear it's kind of like maybe I just missed it you know maybe it's <laughs> to us at the best of times you know and in fact it'd been reported in the press I've got a million pounds for one sample but you're absolutely right the whole uh, digital representation of being able to reproduce these things is a very concerning thing. And I, as I'm sitting at home listening to him and taking part, I'm thinking, this isn't right. No, it's not a, it's not a, not for a commercial release in that, that sense or whatever. But I don't know what the solution is in some in some way. In, in England, what they're trying to do is, if you produce any record, now what you have to do, they're trying to introduce this new form, and uh, you you know produce whatever what, whatever type of music you're producing, you. Uh, with the form you include a tape of the original recording. So if this ever got released, I would produce the sound from Hymna that I chose, the way I processed it, what I'd done to it, whether I'd slowed it down or used it exactly, and then how I put it into the composition that finally got released. And then that has to go to the record company to then say yes or no. Not to the Stockhouse, it would be no, there would be no question of it. There's a whole interesting thing with Stockhouse, which is with this magazine, The Wire magazine again. Uh, six months ago in England, I met up with the editor, I know that reasonably well, because London's not that big a place for really, as you probably know. Bump into the same people, and I was talking to the editor. He said, after the, uh, the feature on Stockhausen, which they had really good feedback on, they thought, why don't we actually try and get a number of artists, it wasn't me at the time, but a number of different artists, to kind of look at Stockhausen pieces, and kind of do not cover versions, but kind of interpretations, or how they see pieces working, and so on. And so uh, they wrote a letter to Stockhausen, and the most phenomenal letter came back from him that said, in big letters, no one has touched the works of Stockhausen. Only Karl Heinz Stockhausen must perform Stockhausen's work. <laughs> and then, <laughs> quite amusing, it's kind of a bit scary. But then I was in New York three weeks ago, and I saw a letter from Stockhausen. Whether this is real or not, giving permission for a similar thing happening in America. I don't quite understand whether this is a, happening or not. It's just somebody's take. So and, uh, yeah, they've got a logo if you want. Turn it off, yeah, what the hell? They've got a logo. <laughs> uh, so I don't know, it's, it's huge. It's, uh, shall I turn it over? Yeah. Who's is it? It's yours. It's mine. <laughs> How'd you open it up? <laughs> 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 well, I honestly don't know what the solution is with that kind of work. And when, with, with a work that's it's, it's like 99% made up of somebody else's work, it kind of scares me. I'd be terrified if I saw this figure suddenly appearing today in the audience, you know, in his big cloak with his, you know, stock housing posse or whatever, you know. <laughs> I'd be embarrassed, but, you know. Maybe he's a good guy after all. No, no. <laughs> why, why don't, this is actually tied up to my first question about yeah. the political reasoning behind what you do. I mean, 
Stockhausen had the nerve to sort of copyright basically um, Zen Buddhist monk singing and calling right. it Stimmung and, and saying he invented this way of singing. This is the ironic thing, this is the ironic thing, this yeah. piece himna, which is national anthems. That's the thing that crossed my mind. Can you copyright national anthems? How can you claim publishing on that? You can't do it. So that does, when I was doing working through mm. the piece, it was like that. But the, the thing I just remembered is that in England, I don't know how it works in other countries, lots of Stockhausen pieces can't be performed because he uses radio, shortwave radio, the BBC will not allow transmissions of other radio stations on the BBC. <laughs> so you can't perform an awful lot of the work. You know? And I've had problems when they play my pieces, which, you know, I do pieces that don't involve phone calls or shortwave radio. I actually, you know, do other kind of pieces of music. But they're always kind of nervous about them. I find it quite amusing because it's a big organisation, but there is that point about the kind of national anthems that cross my mind. It's like, can you, you can't copyright it, but he's published by Stockhausen you know, for large. Well, so. I, I think you should be fighting it. You think? Absolutely. Can you join in with the competition? <laughs> no, I mean, it's, 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 it's a question of that. That's the situation we, we've arrived at now. Yeah. And I think politically you have to decide whether you're for this industry or whether you're against it. Yeah, it's, I mean, this is the kind of scary thing. When you start, when you're involved in something, you start using words like industry, which is right. I'm involved in an industry with a capital I, music industry. And so many records in England have just opened up a, the whole section devoted to sampling. They've employed staff, and their whole job is just to chase samples now. Which is terrifying in some sense. I can see all these people kind of quivering at home now, thinking like, shit, what are I sample? And so on. And then you get bands like Public Enemy, this American hip-hop band, who won't give permission for anybody to sample from their records, even though their records are entirely made up of samples of other people's records. And there's this kind of absurd kind of hall of mirrors effect you get, where you kind of all stare at each other going, you give me permission, no, you give me permission, and so on. So it's, it's got so complex now, that there almost isn't a simple answer to it. I'm not sure, and in England, they're getting really nervous about it. I've had meetings with lawyers talking about the work and so on. It's just terrifying in some sense. The, the, the scale of the, the actual thing is so big, and they're talking about, uh, Incorporating like a digital code into recordings now, so you can't sample from it. But how that copes with the, the enormous amount of CDs and records that are out there already, it's a completely, it's just a, a tokenist kind of element. Uh, it's, um, it's very simple. Uh, ideas are not protected. Yeah. Sounds are not protected. It's only pieces of art, whatever they might be, which are yeah. So if you use a passage from a stock album piece or from somebody else, yeah. this passage. But then it gets more complex when these people have taken elements from other people's mm -hmm. work, and it's kind of. I mean, the classic story I just heard recently, which is quite funny, I should tell you, is a it was a British pop band. It was probably a, it was probably a hit here as well. Got in the top ten in England, just like a pop group, and they were really happy about the record. And then a publisher came to them and said, "You've sampled one of our artist's records. You know, you cannot do this. It's illegal." And they said. What do we do? You can have 100% of our publishing. You know, we're so happy to have a hit single. You can have 100%. What they failed to tell the other publishing companies, there were six samples on the record. Okay, so the record was played on the radio. So one of the other record companies rang up a pop band and said, you sampled our record. And they said, we have, but you have to talk to the other company. So the other company is now being sued by five other companies. It's moral there somewhere. <laughs> uh, how do you see it personally if uh, somebody would take a record of you and uh, completely re rework it? And, well, I tried uh, to do it. I tried to do it in Belgium. I tried to get people to kind of rework the stuff. I did this radio show and I kept saying, would people please sample this? Yeah. And I was going to put a compact disc out of all the... We're talking about techno music now. So. Oh, techno in what, in general? Or, so what, as in... No, uh, I think you also produced uh, techno music, or not? Yeah, I've done. Yeah, so this, this is very popular in some scenes, so uh, it would be uh, possible to make a commercial product of it, just uh, rework it and, and, and try to ask money it's for particularly it. particularly important, I'm really, <coughs> really kind of flattering in some ah, sense, you know, yeah, yeah. kind of visual aesthetic. I mean, you know, I come from a kind of, I studied literature, and I'm always interested in the way that, like, you get a writer like Kathy Acker, an American writer, whose work almost entirely depends upon reinterpreting other kind of archaic texts and so on. Yeah. And there's, there's a whole group of kind of artists who work with kind of manipulating, sort of deconstructing yeah. other kind of media and so on. So work I've always kind of admired is artists who've done the same work. And I've like John Oswald, the Canadian artist, who got into an awful amount of trouble for pressing the CD that has like all samples of Michael Jackson and so on. Mm -hmm. And what's scary there is you realise that 
the, the speed they suddenly, the, the record companies will catch up with people for a CD that isn't for commercial gain, it wasn't to be sold, it was to be given away as a representation of his work. But you publish also via uh, official companies, so we have the underground network distribution, yeah. uh, which d doesn't care about anything uh, like this, but uh, you had a case like that uh, your company yeah. went out uh, to sue somebody. Yeah. But how do you feel about that then? I mean, uh, you have no, you have no uh, control. You have no control, no, and ironically after that I turned down the money, which could have potentially happened, you have to go to court, it's a long, long process, which mm. potentially could have still gone on now. Turned out the money, then my record company dumped me. Mm. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I still don't have a record deal. I'm not particularly running for one either. Yeah. It gives you a kind of freedom. But I know so many awful horror stories about people with record deals that, mm. you know, suddenly become kind of destroyed their career because certain expectations uh, are made of you and so on. So I don't quite want to. And what do you think then about the independent uh, networks? Uh, still, I mean, still, yeah, the validity is still really important. It's the same way that. The exciting thing about punk when it was first around was the fact that it inspired yeah. people to kind of begin doing stuff on your own. And when digital technology became cheap, compact, yeah. I mean, like a mixer like this, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, would have been this big and so on. You can get mixers much smaller than this now, really, you know. And the fact that it's become so domesticized in some sense, you don't need to commercially go to a recording studio so much anymore. You can record in your own bedroom or something, you know, because you're using not live microphones, everything is direct input, everything goes into the desk, you can wear headphones and work if you want to. And I know a number of quite successful techno artists who don't even have speakers, you know, they just use headphones the whole time. I think it's really positive in a sense of like production of music, these people will press 500 CDs, it, it links in with a kind of self-publication of work and like fanzine culture, and it's kind of, I mean fanzine culture is really interesting because it's a, a culture that exists for people publishing magazines that aren't for financial gain, it's almost for like uh, distribution of information, like a network that exists. You I think it's, it's growing, I hope. And yeah, I, it's I been around for years, and it will continue to grow. And I think yeah. it's, one of the, it's one of the most valuable things we have as individuals, is that ability, like today if we wanted to, if somebody's recorded this, we can go to a studio this week and put it onto a record. In one week's time, you can cut that record, mm. you know, without any record company intervention, and sell it as an album, God forbid. But uh, you still... Uh uh, wanting to work with uh, official companies. Yeah. If I get offered work, you know, and it's it's work. I'm a freelance, you know, artist. Uh -huh. I do writing and all kinds of stuff. It's, you get offered a commercial piece of work for a record company. It's kind of why would you say no if you need to live? You know, mm, yeah. it's not it's not such a great moral dilemma for me sometimes. But oh, right. no, I'm not going to sign to Warner Brothers or EMI because, as one record company said to me, we really like the work we're having, but we. We don't think we could sell it, you know. Uh, and it's, it's interesting because they can't market it. They can't see a way to market yeah. more abstract, avant-garde, you know, experimental work. And it's funny the way that maybe people in this room, we're, it sounds arrogant saying it on behalf of everyone, but kind of more educated in some sense because we, we hear of artists like, and there's, there's techno bands like the Orb and the Aphex Twin and so on. You go out into the street, the average person has never heard of these artists or whatever, even though these artists have sold... 150,000 copies of the last album and so on. And our kind of parameters are so changed from what other people kind of approach. You know, I never go and see successful American Hollywood movies that don't interest me. I go and see a lot of kind of art films and so on. And that's kind of my visual aesthetic. That's what makes me happy and satisfies me. And I kind of forget sometimes there's an awful lot of people out there who listen to Simply Red and Tina Turner and so on. And good luck to them, really, but it kind of scares me at the same time. <laughs> Yeah. All right. I've got another question. Not about uh, let's come back to the samples, but not in terms of um, copyright. Yeah. Um, uh, you talked about, uh, there was another question, I don't remember, you talked about the <coughs> dialects and languages which you yeah. are sending, uh, recording and sending in the yeah. different regions of um, Europe. Uh, you could imagine that there is an enormous immensity of sound, of uh, language sound, yeah. and of sound in nature in the industry. Uh, why is it necessary to keep to already preceded sounds like sounds in Stockhausen compositions? Wouldn't right. it be much more uh, fantastic just to take your own stuff which you have uh, recorded yourself and to build up something without uh, referring to... Uh, that's usually, I mean, obviously, I'm sorry, but I, mean, I do, yeah, I do lots of other work and a lot of my work, that's, that's the basis it comes from. I do a lot of composition, create pieces just using voices just using human voices. This is the first piece I've ever done in my life 
where I've been asked to do something with another artist's work. Okay. So, yeah, so it's just... And I'm playing something one day. No, you talked about pitch. Uh, that's, yeah, that's, that's the only thing I've been asked to do that in number two. Amazing. 32 years, I'm doing well. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Um, what's your relation and what do you think of the acoustic, acoustic music or music produced by, by wooden instruments? Uh, what do I feel about it? Or? Yeah, and, and where, where does the future of that genre of the music making, what future does it have? In well, since, well I've, got a, I've got a friend called uh, Kath music. Matthews, who I believe has done stuff here, and she's a violin player. What Kath does incorporates kind of digital technology with the kind of acoustic, I don't know if anybody knows her work here at all, or apparently I think she studied at Stein. Yeah, yeah somebody's nodding. And uh, she used, <laughs> she's a, a classically one person, that's the two of us. Everyone knows her. Right, fantastic. Uh, but uh, she's a, a classical violinist. She's a trained musician. She's a fantastic, you know, performer. But she uses uh, kind of the latest MIDI software and so on. I, I find it quite, for me, coming from my kind of digital, uh, kind of the last ten years of kind of digital background in some sense, to see somebody incorporating this kind of sound is really exciting. But I have to reference a kind of thing that happened to me when I was a student. I went to see uh, Philip Glass's Agnatum, the opera. And I was at this place called the Royal Opera House in London, which is a gigantic space. And I was a student, so I had the cheapest seat, in the, like, like kind of hanging from the rafters at the top of the building. It was only five pounds, all I could afford. And uh, I was with my fellow students, and uh, when I was studying literature, I was surprised that the people I was with were kind of mature students, i.e. I was kind of 18, and they were like my mum's age, which is kind of a bit kind of disturbing, first of all, but it was quite exciting. So we all went to the opera. We were sitting in the audience, listening to Agnatum, and afterwards... We all clapped, and we turned around to each other, and I said, uh, what did you think then? Uh, one of them said to me, what do you think, Robin? And I said, well, I had a real problem with the volume, because it was really quiet, because my ears are tuned to go to rock concerts and this kind of thing. I said, I had a real problem with the volume. And the woman next to me said, I know, it was far too loud, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Which is quite interesting, because it reflects back on that kind of acoustic environment. And how, you know, I did a show with a band called Deus, this uh, Belgian band. They were quite popular. They are popular here, it's like a rock band. But they have an alternative project, which is a really interesting kind of classical with two pianists and a, like a string quartet. And we played in a venue in a place called my, my, the Belgium is still, uh, Tonga Room or something, I think it's called. <laughs> Close, maybe. Uh, and uh, they did this concert in kind of a, a rock venue, which was great. It was actually really exciting to see two live pianists and a string quartet doing this stuff. And people really get into it. And apparently, that album sold phenomenally well. I mean, really successful. And they're coming to England in a few weeks as well, so I imagine they're going to pick up there, but hopefully it's, it's not, I don't mean it's too late for classical music, or, I don't mean, but for classical instruments, I should say, you know, classical instrumentation, you know, it's not, it's not too late at all, but hopefully with this kind of work happening, it's quite a sort of positive thing again. Sorry. How open-minded do you, do you find the uh, English techno scene to experiments? Uh, very good, actually, amazingly so. That's what I couldn't believe. You know, because I've been recording for like, 15 years and some dreadful things I've done. I mean, truly, like anybody who's done like the photography, you've done terrible work and so on. And people were very open minded. I'm sorry? In club environments. In club environments, that was the exciting thing that you could start playing stuff that you think you can never get away with and people wouldn't criticise it. And it's not because they've taken drugs and they listen to the dog barking for nine hours or something. <laughs> it's, it's, it's because almost their ears are being educated in some sense. And I don't know, music education in England is really. You know, fallen down anyway. So there's lots of education, unfortunately, we have, you know. And it really is it's not even a secondary thing. I mean, languages don't even exist for us to study, which is why stupid English people don't speak other languages, because we never, we never have that opportunity. And if you want to study music, it's an option you have to actually take yourself. As a kind of 11 year old kid, it's difficult for you to decide that. You just want to kick a ball around if you're a boy, you know, most times. Yeah. Uh, was a bit, my question is a bit in a concert. Uh, Contrary with uh, what he said about the wooden instruments, uh, what do you think about uh, extreme noise like match power and all this? Personally, uh, I find it really hard work after a while. I, I used to listen to, to it. Listen to it. Sorry? The hard work is to listen to it. Yeah, the hard work is to listen to it. Maybe that's, that's the process, that's the, not the point of it, but that's something you have to engage with with that work. It's part of what that work is representing to you. But there's an awful lot of that work. The, the, the only problem I have after a while is distinguishing between different artists. When I, uh, I give it to the second. So you can tell it in a second. Yeah. We can do it ten. I don't know. Do 
intense. Uh, but no, I personally, you know, I find it very hard work. But then again, people here find other things hard work. We're each, you know, we're individuals, which is the exciting thing. We all like different things, you know. We all like the same things. We'd all be listening to Tina Turner, which would be terrifying. But I mean, there's, there's uh, all over the world, there's lots of bands, groups, individuals making a hell of noise, uh, just playing noise. Yeah. And, uh, the and they all have their own atmosphere. And uh, but this will never reach a big audience. Yeah. But uh, it's there to stay. It's already there for yeah, absolutely. Years. There's no problem with it, personally. Uh, I, it's not the first thing I choose to listen to in the morning, you know. Yeah, I know it. <laughs> It depends how you get up, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. We should maybe stop there. Is that in a minute? Oh, sorry. Uh, I have a question. Maybe that's, for example, Jeff Mills. He, uh, yeah. in early days, saw this uh, mm-hmm. Warren 303. So he had to search for new ways uh, to make music. Right. And nowadays, he thinks, he thinks that uh, for 15 years ago, it was, one couldn't imagine to make a record, a record that wasn't, that didn't change. And he says, nowadays, it has become a norm. So, I've got to go the other way, perhaps right. the psychedelic uh, kind. Yeah. So he is always very aware of uh, the fact that, that his music has to be in, innovative, and he, he does this with yeah. things like that. How is it that in your music? Is that a factor that... I think it is with most people. Nobody wants to work on, a, on the same plane. You know, if you're, I mean, it must be very difficult if you're a successful artist, because you have a, a certain uh, success that, that, that is related to something you've created. Therefore, the next project you do there must be this kind of moral kind of thing saying, I should really do something rather like the last one, because that was a really big success. I'm lucky in the success, I'm probably not that successful. So I can freely kind of move between these different movements. And so I play techno clubs, and I play more beat-oriented stuff. I do more abstract stuff, and I do, I'm working with all kinds of different projects at the moment, everything from kind of working with an Asian singer in London doing some stuff, just all vocal stuff, no instruments or anything, just her voice, and kind of processing it and making that into sort of pieces of music and so on. So. I feel quite lucky that I can kind of move between these different genres, these different kind of movements or whatever, and still get away with it for the time being. Uh, uh, so what was the Bjork settlement then? I'm sorry? What was the Bjork settlement actually then? It was nothing. Nothing at all. No, it was me without a record deal. And, uh, so they lost. They, uh, the, the case very simply, I should just quickly say, was I released a record called Mass Observation nearly four years ago, and uh, I suddenly had a phone call about uh, last June, like June the 1st, from her record company on a Friday to say, Robin, in her infinite wisdom, Bjork has sampled you for her new album. And I said, what do we do? I don't know. It, I, names like Bjork don't usually come to me on the phone. It's kind of, you know, as I said, Tarantino doesn't ring me up and go, Robin, I love your record, man, or whatever. And so I didn't know. I didn't honestly know. And so on the Monday, I told my record company, and on the Tuesday, so later on that Monday, I learned that they filed a lawsuit for £150,000. I didn't know anything about it. And they pulled the record from the shop. And they deleted the record, the Bjork album, which was like a million selling album and so on. And the issues get really complex and it went on over three months. And I said, I'm not interested, let's try and forget this. And I said to my record company, wouldn't it be a really good media thing for you to say, hey, we forgive you, Bjork. Let's do a record together, and it'd be really nice. We'd all love each other and be one big happy family, but no, it never happened. And uh, I had a lawyer acting for me separately from my record company, and fighting against my own record company, <laughs> which is absurd. But I mean, Bjork was really nice about that. I met up with her. She got her record company to pay my legal bill, so it was like, I mean, she was very, very good about it. Maybe guilt does that to you, I don't know. You know? But, uh, and it's that awful scenario, which is like, did she think, as somebody said to me, did she think she could get away with something me because I'm sort of an independent artist? Why should she clear it and so on? Or did they genuinely forget it? That was a, a kind of moral being. I have to think, well, they forgot. You know, I don't think they honestly do that. I hate to think that somebody would quite consciously try and rip somebody else off like that. Something so optimistic. <laughs> Especially after three months of torture like that. <laughs> so it all, got, it all kind of got resolved. So I've now got a friend called Björk, you know, big deal, and uh, I don't have a record deal, you know, but her album got reissued with my sample on it, and in fact it's going to be the new single. The thing is, if I had said yes to uh, accepting money on it, not only would it have destroyed me kind of creatively, I think, and kind of mentally in a way, in the way representation of my work in the media and so on, you'd be known as the person who got, you know, did you, I mean, you sampled mobile phone. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, wasn't, isn't that, I mean, I know in America at least that that's a 
serious, you know, is that violating, I mean, how do you get violence? Yes, it's a huge issue, which I can probably talk to you about later. It's kind of, yeah, it is. It's a, a huge violation of many rights or whatever, but I tried to, with a journalist in England and in America, when I was in New York three weeks ago, we tried to check this out. And you ring up the police, the police say, I'm sorry, we're not interested in that. Would you please ring Scotland Yard, who are the bigger, the next step? And Scotland Yard say, we don't really care. Why don't you speak to the Radio Communications Act? You speak to the Radio Communications Act, we don't really give you any feedback either. And you get thrown in this huge circle. But part of the work I've been doing is about access to information, media, uh, images of, uh, of representation of what you do and so on. And what uh, I've been very careful about is editing. I don't use any names, addresses, phone numbers, anything. I use raw material. I've used friends to do stuff as well. Whether you know when you listen to one of my records, whether it's a real conversation or somebody I know and so on, you don't know at all. But during one of these sample debates recently, uh, I learned that apparently the human voice, if I recorded somebody here, I actually would own copyrights on it. In England, anyway, that's the way it will work. The, the, the kind of moral dilemmas and so on are huge about this. It'll probably take me forever. I've actually got to do a sound check tonight. See, that's the thing. Yeah. Just so the deck, you know, that's all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Did you also use those phone calls to stop the job at least? I should have done, shouldn't that would be a good idea actually. Yeah, I, should have. I just want to take a picture actually, if you don't mind. Just show my family or something. <laughs> 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 